Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I am very happy to um, welcome you to the Thursday uh, colloquium of um, Ayuka. This is Shoma Prachudri, and I'm very happy that even though we changed the time to an unusual time uh, today, we have our regular audience with us. Um, we're still completely online with our colloquium, and we, we probably are exactly um, two years after we started the colloquium. It was first weekly and then twice a month. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so I'm happy to see a lot of people have stuck with us. Of course, today we are um, very, very fortunate to have um, uh, Professor Joe Silk um, for our colloquium. Um, Professor Silk needs no introduction. Joe um, was, of course, uh, at uh, core faculty at, at uh, Berkeley for uh, three decades, then became the civilian professor um, at Oxford. Um, for several years, and now is at the Institut d'Astrophysique, um, as well as the University of Pierre Marie Curie in, in, in Paris, um, along with uh, various appointments at, at Johns Hopkins and, and Oxford. But uh, that's not, of course, his, uh, um, his identity. Uh, he's one of the, uh, the greatest cosmologists alive, and he's going to tell us about the future of cosmology. So over to you, Joe. And uh, uh, we'll, I hope we'll have some time for questions because I know you have a limit after your talk. Over to you, bye-bye. Thank you so much uh, for hosting me and thanks to the Institute for, uh, for the invitation. Okay, so I'm going to um, take a uh, long-term view in this talk about where we're going in cosmology, where we should be going. And I'm gonna make the case that um, you know, we have issues right now in cosmology. I'll briefly summarize them. And I think the moon is going to provide us with a site for a real progress to be made. Um, so here is um, a history of the universe, one that you all know well. On the right today, mature galaxies going back in time. Um, uh, you can see uh, before the first stars, before uh, there was any structure at all, what we call the dark ages. And then before then, um, the microwave background, uh, which is our fossil radiation from the Big Bang, uh, all the way back to um, the big mystery of inflation. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, two epochs. One, the dark ages. And one um, early in the history of the production of the microwave background, the, the fossil radiation on the left, and tell you how studying these two uh, will provide the new frontiers in cosmology and hopefully lead us to progress. But we have to build very novel telescopes. That, and I'll, I'll describe those briefly. And so those are my two, my two focal points for this talk. So why the moon? Um, well, I, I really think that new ideas are needed now and the moon is amazing. It's got a space-like environment. There's no atmosphere to trouble optical infrared viewing of the skies, no ionosphere to trouble low frequency radio. It's seismologically stable, so that, that's a great advantage. And um, moreover, what we can do there there's radio astronomy at low frequencies that would be very, very difficult, if not impossible from the Earth. We can do far infrared at terahertz frequencies. We can even do gravity waves and optical, which I mentioned briefly. So I think it's fair to say that um, there's a great future awaiting us, and I'm going to argue, indeed, the whole future of astronomy and maybe cosmology um, as well um, may lie on the moon. Of course, getting there is a whole issue in itself. I'll discuss that too. So let's start where I think modern cosmology really begins, um, which is the pioneering work of um, Georges Lemaitre, who, of course, um, made a strong case for the, um, um, was one of the pioneers indeed, along with Hubble, of the um, expansion rate of the universe. And what um, he also made uh, a major contribution to was our understanding of the acceleration of the universe. Because Lemaitre showed 
that um, because of quantum vacuum fluctuation, remember this was the very beginning of quantum theory, in 1933, he made the point that there should be a negative pressure in the universe. And this is what he called the cosmological constant. In fact, he was the pioneer of what we now call dark energy. Um, um, equation of state pressure equals minus rho c squared. And, um, and this constant has um, dominates our current thinking about cosmology. We've found remarkable evidence for it, of course. Um, and um, but at the same time, we have frustrations. And so since Lemaitre's pioneering work in the 1920s, 1930s, um, uh, the major new development has been inflation. Um, we're now you know, 40 years on, um, and we don't really have a, a clean idea of inflation, of proving that it really happened. And this has led to current frustrations. And inflation in itself requires dark matter. We don't know what the dark matter is. We see, um, we're pretty sure we, we, we detect it. Most of us are pretty sure of that. Um, there is the dark energy too, which is measured as a contribution to recent acceleration of the universe. But is it really a con described by Lemaitre's constant or is there some physics there to be discovered? Again, big question mark. Inflation um, would be wonderful if we could verify it. It has a number of predictions that are not so easy to test. One of the main ones, though, is there should be a gravity wave background. And that's the focus of many experiments um, ongoing and in the next decades to try to test this. This would be a wonderful proof. However, it's not going to be so easy. Um, and let me just explain why I believe that. Well, first of all, um, when you look at all the data that we have currently on dark energy, um, bringing together the, the various large scale surveys, dark energy survey, various others, you can see that they're all currently converging with um, two or three percent error bars um, on P equals minus rho, that, that is W equals minus one for the equation of state which essentially is the metric's prediction of a cosmological constant. And so the question is, as we reduce these error bars on the data sets, um, uh, which include, of course, um, gravitational lensing and cosmic microwave background and supernova, those are basically the three main ones and related things, will we actually find evidence that Lambda is not exactly a constant, that would be wonderful, but there's no indication yet. And we'll have new telescopes coming on board soon um, to, to reduce those, those error bars to the 1% level. Will we find anything? We have no idea. Um, dark matter is also an area of great frustration to many of us. We just have no idea um, uh, how, to, um, how, how to live with um, with, with dark matter because there's such a huge parameter space. So you can see here that um, if I regard the cross section as um, something that we have to measure for dark matter particle interactions, we think it's most likely some sort of fundamental particle and the particle mass at the bottom, then you know the bits really are um, completely open as to where you might be. The regions highlighted in color, especially with the red band, are regions that we can search more or less. But look at all the vast space, all those decades where we have no idea what, is, what might or might not be going on. And the experiments so far, the underground experiment indicated by Xenon NT and similar ones, and um, have not found any direct evidence for dark matter particle interactions, dark matter existence, as should be the case. And if dark matter self annihilates, as many theories predict for the heavier dark matter particles, um, then we should see gamma rays. Perhaps we haven't seen those yet either. So it's a frustrating story at the moment. Uh, and it doesn't get any better actually when we look at the microwave background. Why? Because you see this plot of the um, gravity wave background parameter, this parameter R, which is the ratio of 10 to the scalar amplitudes and various predictions, wonderful limits to date 
from experiments, including the Planck experiment. Um, but the problem is that there is no lower bound as to what this um, gravity wave um, component, the strength of that component might be. Um, we have new experiments coming on board in the next few years, um, a light bird and um, CMB stage four, which are destined to push the um, scalar potential ratio down to parts in a thousand, slightly below perhaps. But we really have no guarantee that we'll find something. That's a frustrating situation. I hope we will find something. And then the, the final domain where we try to get a handle on dark matter comes from another direction, that is um, smashing particles together at high energy. So far, the LHC has not been successful in finding dark matter candidates as predicted, for example, by um, supersymmetry. And we're now considering building a, um, a huge upgrade, the future circular collider, which will take us up to the 100 TV range, perhaps. Again, there's no guarantee of success that we'll find um, evidence for candidates for theories which um, or even direct detection of possible dark matter particles by, the, by their absence, essentially, in experiments. OK. Um, we can even go to modified gravity. Um, many people are intrigued by this. That may be one way of um, salvaging the, 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 the situation in some of the tensions we're having, the, la the lack of finding dark matter, for example. But again, there's no strong motivation, in my view at least, that um, no strong evidence that Einstein's theory doesn't work on all the scales we've tested it so far. So there's one common feature to all these various um, arguments, and that is there's no guaranteed return. We have to do these things, but wouldn't it be, um, you know, we have to improve. That's the story of how physics has gone, do better and better and better. But at this point, we are, uh, it's a good point to worry a bit that we should be looking at new experiments, perhaps, where there is maybe a guaranteed return that can answer some of our deepest questions. And I'm going to make the case to you, give you two examples of where there is maybe um, such a guaranteed return. Okay, and this consists of going to new frontiers that we really haven't explored yet to any significant extent. So the first one is what we call the dark ages. So this is before there were galaxies, before there were stars. Very hard to see, but you do it with hydrogen. Um, by going to 21 centimeter emission of um, atomic hydrogen, by going to very, very high redshift, you can probe the precursors of galaxies in the first 10 million years of the universe. And I'll show you that this can be a wonderful way of, in fact, indirectly testing inflation theories. And one more interesting um, argument is that another realm also that's very poorly understood so far is in the first thousand years of the universe or so, when um, after the cosmic black body radiation was produced, it should receive the imprint of small scale structures in the universe. Um, this is predicted by our standard arguments about dark matter, the so-called cold dark matter theory. And this, these imprints lead to spectral distortions. So far we have a perfect black body, but we should be able to go beyond that and look for something. And that is a, also a prediction, a definite prediction. So let me explain now how um, the first of these ideas works um, to look at 21 centimeter radiation um, long ago um, and probe the dark ages with interferometry. But the first point is that our galaxy um, today, our dark halo, uh, consists of many, many small su substructures that merge together over time, so that um, if you could track the hydrogen parts of these substructures, you'd have vast numbers of building blocks to see in the very early universe. And this will give you many, many um, bits of information, far more than you get with other experiments, as I'll show you. In, indeed, this information argument must lead to the ultimate precision that you could do. And the question, of course, is how on earth do we unlock this? 
how do you do? Well, here is sort of the way it might go. Um, the microwave background, so th this is the um, power spectrum um, of um, uh, fluctuations. The microwave background fluctuations um, have something like a, a few million modes, basically the number of pixels on the sky, that's the information you have. And they peter out um, on uh, archimedic scales. Um, large scale structure where you can survey um, billions of galaxies, uh, give you far more modes, maybe 100 million, but the ultimate comes from 21 centimeters um, and the very, very early universe where you can in principle, because after all, I have billions of galaxies and uh, millions of building blocks for galaxies. So in principle, I can get trillions of modes. And that information argument is a great way to increase precision in cosmology provided you can think of a clever way, a robust way even to unlock this position. That's, that's the challenge. And the way to try to think of this, how to do that is to go to 21 centimeters and go back in time and look at the, um, if you like the shadow of the hydrogen gas uh, on the cosmic microwave background. And you should see um, because of the, uh, the hydrogen is basically more recently we ionized mixed structure. Before then there were black holes and stars and sources of Lyman alpha photons, for example, that um, gave you an effective coupling to the baryons. Um, but if I go back even further, before there are any stars, um, because the gas um, cools more effectively than the microwave background as the universe expands, you should see a shadow in the microwave background. And this is where we, what we call the dark ages, when you might expect to see this. And it's, you know, it's, it's maybe, it's not bright, it's 30 millikelvin against the um, a signal in the sky. Um, and, but it, it's where we have to go. The problem is that we're now looking at frequencies um, that are, you know, 30 to 50 megahertz. That's basically the problem. Uh, because of the high redshift. So that's the challenge, how do we get there? So there is one way to get to such low frequencies, maybe the only way, and that is you, you have to um, go to a very radio quiet place where there's no ionosphere um, to bother you at low frequencies. And the far side of the moon is ideal. It's free from any human interference, of course, um, at the moment anyway, um, and this is where we should are considering placing radio interferometers. So how does the radio story work? Well, um, you use 21 centimeters, um, the spin flip transition of atomic hydrogen um, to look say um, a register of 50, that's more or less a sweet spot for for looking for this shadowing against microwave background, and that is going to 30 megahertz or a wavelength of 10 meters. Um, and so that in principle doesn't involve any dramatically new technology. It's the same technology we, we um, use basically for the SKA at low frequencies. Um, in principle then putting in some rough numbers, if you could lay out on the moon a series of let's say dipoles to keep it really simple, but that may not be the optical shape, um, interferometer with typically, um, you know, 10 meter length dipoles. This is the crudest possible way, TV like antennas, if you like, spread over maybe a hundred kilometers. <clears throat> then you could get um, with that sort of number, a hundred kilometers compared to 10 meters, you get resolutions that will be 10 times better than you can see in the CMB, and thereby um, allowing you to unleash um, much, much more information. And what you need is to make this fairly sensitive. And that means filling this 100 kilometer area with dipoles, perhaps. And that might mean millions of dipoles. This may sound crazy, but we are already um, planning 100,000 dipoles for the, um, or tripoles for the SKA, for example. There is a problem. Um, first, there, there are pilot projects uh, under serious planning to go to the far side of the moon, um, both by um, 
of the US and by the Chinese space agencies um, in the next um, five or 10 years um, with hundreds of antennae as a step. But the problem is the following, it's the foregrounds. We're looking for this 10 millige signal in a really bright sky. And the sky at low frequencies is thousands of Kelvin, as you can see in this, um, this figure on the left. So there are clever ways to attack this because um, if you think about um, along the line of sight with the redshift, you can use um, the frequency resolution um, uh, and compare that with the angular resolution to basically give you um, a cut in um, wave number space, which may enable you, we think, to help sort out the foregrounds and, and leave um, a clearer signal, because the foregrounds are frequency structure, basically, and, and leave you somewhere to go um, to look for the intrinsic signal. Um, another way, an important way to get rid of all the foregrounds, because many of them come from radio galaxies, is to um, build a, an Arecibo type telescope on the far side of the moon. So here is a design, a recent design for such a thing. Um, this would have to be part of the major project, I'm sure, but it would involve um, instrumenting a lunar crater, much like we did for um, Arecibo or currently for FAST, to do direct imaging and remove all of the sources. So this in principle is, is very futuristic. This is the sort of thing we can imagine, we can imagine doing. Um, now, let me briefly explain the beauty of this approach in terms of testing the inflation theory. So the idea is the following, that intrinsic to essentially all inflation theories is that um, the universe, the fluctuations which see structure developed in the theories cannot be completely random. Um, the theories predict levels of non-Gaussianities. Now they're, they're very small um, and we've been searching for these in the microwave background and we will do soon at a better level in galaxy surveys as with the new surveys. Uh, but in terms of microwave background, it's simple to see this. It's a, it's a quadratic correction to the temperature fluctuations. And the, 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 the numbers we get from Planck and other CMB experiments are not very encouraging because what you're looking for is this fundamental threshold common to essentially all types of um, theories of something like 0.01. And that depends, the simple prediction depends only on the known spectral index or the fluctuations in the CMB. So that's a challenge because currently with the CMB, with our, as I said, millions of modes fixed um, on the sky, you can set limits on this non-Gaussian parameter of order 10. With Galaxy, the new generations of Galaxy surveys, we're hoping to improve this to numbers like Unity. That's a very, very long way from 0.01. However, once you can open up the treasure trove of all of these um, modes of hydrogen clouds, then in principle, you will get, and you can also slice the universe up in redshift when you do this, of course. So you can, in principle, unlock um, trillions of modes, which would get you down to um, 0.01 for this primordial parameter, which should be a robust prediction of inflation, I think. And this might be conservative because we know there are possibly strange things going on at the very small scales, which require boosted power, extra power. One of them is the formation of primordial black holes. No direct evidence for that yet, but it's one of the conjectures that is appealing to a lot of people at the moment and, and other things. And so um, this then is a promising um, goal to get a real, real test, uh, maybe the best precision you can imagine for cosmology. Okay, so um, let me now take you to my second concept, which is another new frontier in cosmology um, so far, essentially unexplored, and that's the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. So we have this wonderful result from the Planck satellite now more than 30 years ago, um, where the black body radiation on, was measured with um, minutes of observing time on the fire ass instrument, um, Fourier transform spectrometer, 
Um, uh, these are 400 sigma error bars you're seeing. It's amazing. Um, and that sets the current errors on the temperature. But if there is any early injection in the universe, and this is a prediction of our known structure theories um, at the moment, there should be distortions. Um, and let me show you the form of these distortions that were pioneered by uh, Sunyev and Zeldovich in the early 1970s. So there are two limits. Um, very early in the universe, you have many scatterings um, of the injected radiation on the microwave background. Um, very early, you restore the black body, but after a year, you don't. And you end up with a injecting energy into the microwave background. You end up with a Bose-Einstein-like prediction uh, spectrum where you have a deficit at low frequencies and augmentation at high frequencies. And if you go to the opposite limit, which is valid in the more recent universe, um, redshift less than a million or thereabouts, um, then, oh, sorry, 10,000 or thereabouts, and then in the, that's the matter dominant era, then you have fewer scatterings, um, but you still get a transfer of energy from the low to the high frequencies by these um, Compton scatterings, and that gives you a similar distortion, a different one, but similar um, in the low and the high frequency regimes. Okay, so the idea then would be to try to measure these to learn about the physics of the early universe, and in particular, the cold dark matter theory that is um, uh, a most popular candidate for cosmology um, in a generic sense. Uh, we haven't found the dark matter, but we assume it allows structure to form on all scales and it's cold. Um, there is this robust prediction that there should be heating of the micro background by the friction of the small fluctuations, um, which um, uh, have now perhaps seeded small, the smallest galaxies or whatever, but that's a prediction that we should be looking for to test that our theory is valid very early. So experiments have been proposed to measure this. Uh, one of the best known um, was called PIXI. It was a, um, a Fourier transform spectrometer. Um, it was a small telescope, very, just one detector basically comparing um, uh, um, a perfect black, an almost a near perfect calibration black body with, with the sky. It was rejected by NASA on two occasions, two different competitions. Um, but people are beginning to realize that this really is the new frontier of micro background cosmology because there is a guaranteed return. And um, the latest news from ESA is that they are, have given high priority to a future mission in the middle 20, 30, 20, 50 timeframe um, to probe spectral distortions, a large mission. And my point here is that, well, one could do that in space. It would be in competition with other missions, of course, which might, and there won't be very many such enormous missions, but the moon may be a natural place to do this. And let me um, expand on that. Um, suppose you put your Fourier transform interrometer in a dark crater near the poles of the moon. Now, the advantage of this is that such dark craters, show you a picture of one, the Shackleton crater, are very cold, 30K. They have enormously high rims, several kilometers high, um, which, because these are near the poles, are in sunlight all the time, but the crater basins in cold and dark. Ideal place to build a telescope, do other things too, perhaps, because you have lots of power and you have cold and darkness. So the idea would be um, to put um, uh, a bolometer array with this uh, interferometer um, and cool the telescope somewhat down to 2.5 Kelvin, have a one half meter telescope, go into terahertz bands. And there is indeed um, a payload that uh, ESA will be launching, which can carry one and a half tons, easily enough to accommodate modules like this interferometer. One could imagine putting them in craters at the south pole of the moon, and they wouldn't even have to um, point. They would scan the sky as the, as the moon um, rotated uh, around the Earth. So this is interesting. Um, uh, this is one example of how the moon may, um, may be the way forward. 
So, um, in a, more generally, though, let's suppose that you decide that you were really want to get your spectral distortions under control, then this shows you the future. So, first of all, the fire rest numbers, dash line, then the foregrounds are, are huge, of course. Um, and this is the real problem because in the red and the blue lines, you can see um, the predictions for the um, few scattering limit, the so-called Y limit, the, the late limit for distortions. Um, the upper part simply mean negative. This is taken in quadrature, remember? So you get, um, sorry, this should be positive. The lower parts are negative. So you see energy subtracted, energy added. Uh, but what I want you to look is the green line. This is the prediction for early energy injection. And you can see it was not achievable by the Pixie experiment, really. But the future um, specs um, proposed for um, a future large class mission in this time frame would easily get you um, the mu distortion. And they would do something else, which to my mind is maybe even more amazing. And that is getting this wiggly gold line. What is that? Well, that line is, represents hydrogen and helium recombination in the early universe. Imagine that, standard physics, the bread and butter of astronomy, we can now in principle study this before the last scattering of the radiation, because that's when helium uh, recombined quite a long time before. And uh, these, the richness of this spectrum in principle um, could give you amazing control over the physics of the universe at this unpresented epoch, if one could ever achieve um, this amazing sensitivity, and of course, get you a pristine value of the helium abundance to boot. So all, all of this is um, wonderful for the future and could in principle be, be done, will be done someday, whether it's on the moon or in space is less clear, I'm optimistic for the moon for another reason I'll show you in a moment. But before I, um, I get to that, let me just summarize where we are with the Planck. Um, this is the, the, the power spectrum of the fluctuations um, going from um, galaxy scales on the left up to um, small scales on the right, very small scales. So the Planck satellite sets this amazing limit um, on, um, on fluctuations on, on, um, on, on various scales here at the small scales, but of course, and cosmic variance makes it uncertain on the larger scales. But then you run out of steam with Planck as you go to small scales because the fluctuations simply don't survive. Um, but um, if you look in other areas such as, I mean, these fluctuations when they're produced, must have left the gravity wave signature too. And there is the microwave background distortion signature as set by Kobe, but that's way, way off in the insensitive regime. So what you need to do is to go to a, this new generation of experiments. And this is what they can do. And on this, I summarize both the 21 centimeter and the far infrared. So the lunar far side experiment could explore this regime of small scale power and the um, Fourier transform um, interferometer experiment would get us down to measuring the mu distortions. And so this is um, maybe the way to go um, in the next 10 or 20 years. So I show you here the filling in the small scale power, taking you way, way down below our current limits from CMB and galaxy surveys. That's roughly the range of wave numbers of 0.01 down to much, much smaller scales. So to summarize the dark ages, pro primordial long gaussianity as well, uh, giving you this as a bonus, this amazing test of inflation and the spectral distortions probe standard atomic physics, all the way back to redshift as high as a, a million or even 10 million to study with helium recombination. Okay. So that's not all. I'm going to close with two more examples of what the moon can do. So first of all, the moon is a great gravity wave detector. 
you know, the Apollo experiments, uh, early Apollo used this, they put seismometers on the moon. Uh, they were studying, um, you know, lunar quakes, whatever, found there were very few, it's a pretty stable surface. Um, but now we're in a new regime entirely for gravity waves. We have the pulsar timing array at very low frequencies, and these are at um, intermediate frequencies, LIGO at high frequencies, Virgo, et cetera, CAGRA. Um, but there are big gaps you can see in this coverage of frequency space. And it's amazing that the moon can fill the gap. What, why is that so important? Well, one could then see the spiraling together of the black holes eventually merge and give you gravity waves that LIGO and Virgo are seeing. And you pick up new phenomena also um, at um, somewhat larger black hole masses. Whether you do this in space or on the moon is unclear. Again, I'll come to my rationale for the moon in a second, but let me end with one more example, which is one fundamental question, which I would add to what I've discussed so far, which is our origins in inflation, is are we alone in the universe? And it is amazing that maybe only the moon will provide the answer. Why do I say that? Well, our current plans and have a, a space, a new space telescope designed to do spectrometry um, um, and look for biosignatures from exoplanets, a plausible Earth-like twins, if you like. So the recent um, US Decadal Review talked about its highest um, priority mission being a six meter space telescope to do just this. And such a te telescope is light limited from its aperture and probably according to the best estimates, would only get about 20 candidates for follow up evidence of bio, serious biosignatures. Imagine what you could do on the moon. Um, gravity is not a real limitation anymore. Um, and I'll show you in a second that funding may not be either. Um, and we can build very big things. So suppose we could work our way up to a 100 meter telescope on the moon. No winds, little gravity. In principle, it's possible. You get thousands, tens of thousands even of targets, plausible targets, useful targets to follow up. And because one thing we're pretty sure of, especially as we look around the solar system, is that life is a pretty rare phenomenon. We only have one example after all on the Earth. Um, we need a large number of objects to study and the size of the telescope is key. Okay, so that's um, basically the message I wanted to give you, except there's one more point I want to end with. And that is that um, I talked about exoplanets getting numbers, looking for atmospheric signatures of life forms. Um, you know, in the exoplanet community, I would say that imaging is the most amazing thing you could imagine. Suppose you could ever image an exoplanet. Think of the wonderful images we have of the planets in, in the solar system. I mean, um, They've revolutionized our knowledge. If you could ever do something similar for exoplanets, wouldn't that be incredible? Well, here's a futuristic example that indeed the moon, and only the moon, would be a great place to do just this. So here is the story. You imagine going to a lunar crater near the pole, permanent shadow, dark cold, and we're going to convert this into a hyperscope. 10 kilometers in aperture to do optical infrared and front. How do you do this? Well, you put maybe a hundred or so five meter mirror segments on tripods across the crater. And then um, you have your focal plane on a gondola suspended from the rims. And you have to do some pretty amazing interferometry to conserve the phases of all your telescopes. Right now, that's a challenge, but you know, in the future, we think less so. But given these numbers of a 10 kilometer baseline and infrared and infrared wavelengths, you could achieve 10 micro arc second resolution. And with that, 
you could get images like this, better ones actually, this was mimicked on the TRAPPY system, but for near exoplanets, such as the one around Proxima Centauri and others, you get amazing images. Um, and um, that would um, be a wonderful asset to studying exoplanets and answering the question of, um, are there life signs out there? Are we alone? Okay, so my final slide or two just will take you through why I think none of this is on such a huge budget that it's crazy. We can be seriously thinking, why is this? Because there seems to be no question that lunar exploitation is the future. We have the space agencies, and um, this includes the Indian Space Agency, planning various projects for the moon. Some are focused on developing potential mining sites. Um, there'll be infrastructure being developed on the moon. Tourism is a major asset for the moon, huge demand for that. And rocket fuel, oxygen, hydrogen uh, resources would be ideal, vast amounts are there to um, develop fuel supplies for interplanetary travel uh, from the low gravity uh, uh, of the moon or from a space station around the moon. So that is part of the example of the, one of the US Artemis program goals. So that, that um, I think is gonna happen. Now, what I've argued is that on the moon, you can do unique cosmology. And we're talking about a time scale of 2040 and, and onwards. And where does the funding come from? These things are incredibly expensive. Well, the lunar program is incredibly, incredibly expensive. Um, and it seems to me that there's synergy there. And the only analogy I will give you is the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can add to that all of our other space telescopes. And this total amounts to of order 5% of the cost of the space shuttle of the International Space Station. Okay, so if we could persuade the powers that be to divert 5%, of lunar infra infrastructure costs and transportation costs, et cetera, et cetera, to science and to cosmology in particular and astronomy too, I've argued that's a key thing too. Um, that would cover these things. And these projects would never survive as standalone projects, but given the lunar infrastructure, we should be thinking of these things. And then finally, you may be thinking, well, this is so futuristic, but look, our biggest projects in science today have very long lead times. For example, I mentioned the Decatur Review. Well, that has an IR optical UV flagship experiment for 2045. Um, we're discussing a 100 TV um, circular particle collider, um, possibly built on the site of near the LHC. The time scale for that is surely 2050 or later. Okay, so we're in the right timescales to do amazing astronomy on the moon. And we're discussing dark ages exploration, CMB spectrum exploration, imaging exoplanets. These are entirely new frontiers. And it seems to me that that's where the future has to lie. So much more than cosmology uh, awaits us on the moon. And my final message is that our space, space agencies need some pressure. We should be lobbying, lobbying now for lunar telescopes. Um, you know, I give examples of China, uh, NASA, ESA thoughts, the Indian Space Agency too, as the biggest lunar exp exploration program. Definitely, this is the way to go. And telescopes should be there somewhere in our projections for the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. That's, that's a lot to take in. Uh, and, and who would have thought that the moon would be the main, main uh, uh, focus for cosmology in the future? Any questions? Uh, please, uh, if, if the audience have questions to um, 
to the speaker, please put up your hand using the hands up option. Uh, just before Sanjit asks the question, Joe, uh, the, of course you alluded to the money at the end and uh, you uh, talked about linking it to other lunar missions, etc. So you must have thought of uh, linking it to uh, the private space missions and, and uh, space tourism and things like that. Do you see a link between the private sector and, and, and such, um, um, uh, such uh, uh, projects? Indirectly, because the private sector is um, highly uh, dependent on um, space agencies. They're intimately connected. And, um, you know, the private sector gets contracts to build these things from the space agencies, whatever they're going to do. And that, that they need enormous amounts of seed money to get going, eventually to tap the commercial ex exploitation aspects. And so I, I feel that it's, um, you know, indeed, uh, the space agencies would need to uh, persuade the private sector that a, a tiny overhead, this 5% overhead of what they're doing is for the benefit of humanity, right? science. I think that that's... I'm talking of Elon Musk and Jeff, Jeff Bezos is of the future who uh, might actually start tourism to, to the moon and each of these tourists could carry on uh, and, and, and contribute to building such things there. That's right. I, we're discussing a 5% tax basically on, on the tourism. Right. Uh, or whatever. Okay, on, on all the infrastructure. So I, I don't think that's, uh, that, that's a lot to... Um, to expect. To, to ask for such a lot to ask for given the return, which is incredible. Uh, Sanjeev, go ahead. Uh, very nice uh, talk. Uh, this is very encouraging <laughs> for to look at the future. So I, my question is that, you know, of course, uh, the, the moon missions are still like in the 2045, uh, uh, 50s, but then uh, can we sort of do something earlier? So the 30 megahertz detector, you said, like, you know, an array of 30 megahertz detectors uh, placing in uh, on the moon, but can we uh, not launch small, uh, in a very large number of small satellites which can carry these 30 megahertz detectors, which could be uh, in free falling orbit so that we know their positions exactly. And then we can cross correlate to sort of probe a uh, redshift of 50 as you were uh, suggesting. Would that be a possibility? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's precisely what um, China is planning uh, with um, a series of, um, uh, more or less CubeSats with dipoles spaced at um, in, in coplanar orbits, but spaced, you know, at different distances from the moon. Um, and um, so that's one of their future projects in the next uh, decade or two. So one has to begin there that they may have, you know, tens of tens of, of elements, but in the future one could imagine many more whole flotillas of CubeSats, um, all going on to the surface. Again, um, it, you know, it's not so difficult to have lunar ro rovers deploy dipoles on the surface. Um, a lot of it will be done ro robotically. So I, I think either orbiting the moon or on the lunar surface, one can imagine hundreds of elements, thousands of elements um, in a reasonable time scale, which would be a pilot for the really big projects, but it would be an amazing window on the dark ages, nevertheless. Yeah, that, that's that's also right. That putting just an array of telescopes on the moon also is much cheaper because nobody actually has to go there. I think sending a number of people to moon to align the detectors is a bigger challenge. But then if the detectors could be sort of dropped somehow and they they then their alignment could be adjusted in the in the data analysis stage by some kind of calibration, then I think it becomes a much easier and then much more near term task. Especially if that's we can... right. Yeah. 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 That's right. I think people have explored the idea of dropping antennas on the moon. I think there are, there are clever ways to do that too. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, ro robotic uh, advancement it will be the key to this, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. Much. Any other questions? I don't see any other hands up. Um, you can put your hand up and ask a question. Anybody else? Sure. Yeah, um, actually, uh, it was a nice talk, uh, Joe, but uh, I just want, can you hear me? Yes, we did. Yes, yeah, hear you. yeah. So, uh, means apart from this cost, means uh, this uh, huge cost of building these lunar telescopes, is there, uh, means uh, what other difficulties one 
can I means uh, one 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 can face if uh, we want to go to moon for this type of building these telescopes. What are the other uh, major difficulties one may face? It's a very okay, nice so question. Yes, yeah, so I think my ma my major concern right now is um, um, human built interference because um, given all these commercial activities being planned for the moon, that's going to create a certain amount of radio noise, which may not be so good for low frequencies of radio frequency. So one, ha one has to figure out ways to um, maintain radio quiet zones on the far side. We, we have enormous problems with, um, you know, with um, micro satellites now flying around the earth um, to give us good internet. Well, we don't want to repeat this, the, the same story um, on the moon, but we have time presumably to d design um, you know, the regulations better in advance of doing the science, I hope. So that'd be my main concern. Thank you. That's great. But we, we think about radio frequency interference on the moon. Dipanjan, go ahead. Hi, Joe Dipanjan here. Yeah. Good to see you. Uh, very, very fantastic talk and uh, uh, looks futuristic. But I was, I, no, you know, the first, one of the first lunar telescopes was actually by the Chinese, so the UV telescope that's been collecting data ever since, you know, so, for several years now. And those kind of missions are feasible. So I, I'm just asking, since you've been worrying about the moon for a while now, in the really short term, are, there, are you aware of more such missions being planned, which are really feasible and can be done immediately? Yeah, hello, Dependent. Yeah, that's right. So the, the, the easiest thing to do um, uh, to, to, to give immediate, so the trouble is the Chinese put a very small telescope on the moon, which is fine. Um, building something bigger would be the future, but that may take a while. But the easiest thing to do is probably um, putting antennae on the far side of the moon. Um, and so there's a project now uh, under study, which will give us a of order 100 such and such dipoles on the far side in, in five years time, for example. So that's the sort of thing that one can, you know, uh, imagine doing with easily with current technology. Uh, yeah. With a hun hundred antennae, you may not quite get to the dark ages, but um, unless there is more power there than we think, you know, who knows what is going on, uh, that it's totally unexplored. So, but also you'll be studying um, issues you know, from the sun, whatever low frequency um, uh, warnings of, um, you know, activity on the sun that's very important for the earth and other things, all sorts of things like that, mega flares. So it'd be invaluable science will be done on the moon and is being planned already, I think. Right, and, and this, this is something that is in, in, in the pipelines, at least being thought seriously? Uh, at least, you know, there are design studies going on. I don't right. think, right. I think people, um, in for the ESA EL3 project, again, um, which takes payloads to the moon, I think, again, one of their um, primary goals that they've been discussing the different objectives would be low-frequency radio astronomy. So all, all these things are high on the list of, um, let's say, planning studies. Um, long, long way from invitation, but that will come in a few years. So um, when we actually start building hardware, I would say maybe within five years at this point. Right. Thanks, Joe. A very fantastic and uh, wild talk. And uh, I hope uh, some of these things we do see in our lifetime. Thanks, Joe. Well, GT, thanks. Thank you, Panchan. I've looked at the YouTube. Um, there were a dozen um, uh, people there last time I looked. No questions there. Are, are there any other questions from the audience here on Zoom? Which peaked at about 100, I, I saw at some point. Uh, a lot of people are leaving. Um, if there are, debunker, debunker has a question. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. A great talk. You know, really enjoyed it. You know, a fascinating idea to make a 10, 10 kilometer optical telescope in a lunar crater. I'm just wondering, you know, has there been any study of uh, how seismically stable the surface will be once, uh, let's say, the mining activities and so on are get, get carried out you know, on the moon. Okay, so I think what we know is that um, uh, it's apart from human activities, robotic activities, it, <clears throat> it's much more stable on the earth, right? So lunar 
lunar quakes are small amplitude, few and far between. Um, that is probably not going to be a problem. Um, human activities would have to be, um, hopefully, in particular areas on the moon, well isolated from the science activities. So then uh, that would solve that problem too, I imagine. So it's a question of how we build in the regulation uh, of such activities when we develop on the moon. Yeah, hopefully there'll be some international agreements which will um, be more advanced than the ones we currently have to um, control activities on the moon. And is the um, asteroid cometary impact on the far side of the moon um, uh, a matter of concern for this or? Sorry, what did you, I missed the key word there. Yeah, the asteroid or cometary impact. Oh, right, yes. So they, um, that's certainly a worry um, um, for habitations, one has to build in. Um, some protection against that sort of thing. Um, for experiments, um, you know, the chance of, of um, hitting a dipole with direct impact is probably pretty small, but um, given it's just a set of wires. But um, yeah, uh, um, I think for extended periods on the moon, yes, there is some issue there, but yeah. um, I've not seen the statistics. I don't know. I don't think the far side or, or the near side, uh, one would face a similar problem. Thank you. Fascinating talk. Thanks very much. Um, anybody else? Last chance before we um, close today's session. Then, um, are there any more questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Wonderful talk, Joe. And it was wonderful to wake us up on a Thursday afternoon. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks. thanks very thanks, much. Thanks so much for hosting me. And um, uh, dream of the moon. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Right. Bye. Soon in person. Bye bye.